During the years when Brazil, China, and other emerging markets have transformed their economies, Africa's resource states remain tethered in the bottom of the supply chain, primarily digging mines, extracting oil, gold, diamond, and other minerals. Perhaps you've traveled to Africa. Perhaps you've volunteered to build houses. Perhaps you've donated clothes or money to support the African community. But decades have passed; little has changed. What exactly happened? Dozens of countries have lifted themselves out of poverty. Why are many African countries left behind? Some believe the poverty and conflict in Africa is a result of centuries of exploitation of European powers. Others blame it on corrupted African leadership. They argue that the outside world has provided substantial foreign aid in recent decades that actually threw the native Africans out of jobs. With all that being said, have you ever heard that the foreign aid and your donated money eventually landed into the Swiss bank accounts of the cronies of African rulers? Has the idea ever come to mind that your out of kind heart donated cash is massively inflating the real estate market? After all, who is to blame? In this video, we're going to look at the story why development in Africa is so difficult. This story has disguised smugglers, corrupted rulers, mysterious foreign partners. They reside in Africa. They come and go, and there's only one thing they care about: ripping off the African people. In the mid 1980s, Nigeria had 175 textile mills. People were energetic, but that generation was not able to produce the young upward mobile elite. Well, that's what their children should have been. Back in the good old days, over 300,000 people were employed in the industry. It was the most important manufacturing sector at the time. These mills produced signature prime colors and the waxiness to the touch. After a quarter century, the big old factories were completely shuttered on the inside. Lizards were going in and out of the gate. For the only 25 remained, many of them struggled to operate at a fraction of their capacity. All but 25,000 people still work in these factories. 92% were cut off. Well, if the textile industry had the potential to steer Nigeria into a prospering path like China or Southeast Asia, what caused the sudden turn? In the 1990s, in the central market of Kaduna, Nigeria's signature wax-printed fabric began to sell for a cheaper price at a lower quality. Though they were still labeled as "Made in Nigeria," not before long, people discovered the truth, and the word of mouth began to spread. China's contraband. For a time, the Chinese material was of much lower quality than the Nigeria originals, but the gap narrowed as Chinese standards rose. During the 90s, Chinese factories began copying West African designs and opening their own distribution branches in the region. 16 factories in China are dedicated to churn out textiles with a Made in Nigeria badge sewn into them. In the 90s, China had a huge comparative advantage of cheap labor compared to the rest of the world. The rapid development of China's manufacturing sector found its way into Nigeria. In addition, Nigeria's electricity cost is so expensive that it was impossible to keep the textile production going. The money laid out in the government contract was not spent for the upkeep and renewal of a functioning electricity system. Power in Nigeria is relied on loud fume belching diesel sucking generators. It's too expensive to maintain beyond the bare minimum number of hours. Just to bring it into perspective, how expensive electricity in Nigeria is, when denominated by the per capita income of a country, the cost to power household electricity in Nigeria is 10 times more expensive than the cost in the U.S. The crippling cost of electricity makes Nigerian textiles expensive to produce. The businessman could sell pants made from Chinese fabric at two thirds the price of those made from Nigerian fabric, and still turn a profit. Cost is lower for both businesses and consumers. Who will keep buying the expensive ones? Wait, isn't the government supposed to protect domestic industry by charging custom and imposing import quotas? Well, we did, at least on paper. But when everybody else is lifting himself into upper class, get a better living by receiving a much fatter pay than his usual salary, if everyone else around you is doing it for months, years, and got away with no problem, you join. Smuggling is a long-established profession on the northern frontier of Nigeria. 
While local consultants spend years investigating the issue mentioned that this is 100% illicit, the locals help do the smuggling. Ahiji Tahiru Mangao, businessman confident of president. He also ranks among West Africa's preeminent smugglers. Growing up in Katsina, Mangao received little formal education. He followed his father's footsteps into import-export business. Many Nigerian businessmen speak of him with a mixture of snobbery, envy, and fear. In the shadier corner of a globalized workshop, Mangao found his perfect business partner, the Chinese who attacked the prospecting wax printing industry. As the Chinese began to take control of the market in league with Nigerian vendors, Mangao acts as the facilitator, the conduit between manufacturer and distributor, managing a shadow economy that includes the border authorities and its political allies. At the northern border of Nigeria, dozens of trucks filled with Chinese-made clothes and fabric are ready to cross the border. The flow of these counterfeits has become so massive that it will be impossible to keep it a secret. Most of the shipments go through under the cover of darkness. By the time, border officials have already received their generous pay by highly organized settling by the likes of Mangao. According to the World Bank, the textile smuggled into Nigeria is estimated at $2 billion a year, equivalent to about a fifth of all annual imports of textiles, clothing, fabrics, and yarn into the whole sub-Saharan Africa. Local Nigerian production has shrunk to 40 million. Between 2009 and 2013, Mangao is set to charge a flat fee of $13,000 per cargo, plus the cost of goods. In 2008, Mangao was estimated to bring about 140 feet shipping containers across the frontier each month. Pretty sweet deal, isn't it? But since the size of Mangao's empire is so massive, how come the government isn't after him? If you're thinking the government is just another beneficiary of Mangao's smuggling empire, well, you're absolutely right. After all, you can't have an unlawful business such big that it's not protected by someone with even more power. In fact, because of the sheer scale of Mangao's smuggling operation, it puts many North senior politicians in his pocket. Many people were benefiting that they wanted to keep things like this. After successfully funding Umaru Yaradua's campaign for governors of his home state Katsina, then for presidency, Mangao ensured his protection at the top of the class. Now we've probably learned how smuggling operates, but the more I thought about it, the more questions baffled me. How did it get started in the first place? Why did nobody rise up and stop it? If people lost their jobs in the textile factory, why couldn't they just find another job, at least selling crops work? What if I told you, even growing crops wouldn't turn a profit? to make a living. At times, we overestimate the power of one individual. We think it's this person that changed the world. But is it possible that even if Mangao was not born, things would have unfolded the same way? There will be another Mangao. Smuggling will still be many people's means to earn a living. How did it happen? The question remains unanswered. Why development in Africa is so difficult? Isn't there a hidden force that brews the corrupted society that spawns the likes of Mangao? What might surprise you is, what people thought is the heaven's gift to the land of Africa actually is the source that creates the suffering of its people. In an ideal economy where new technologies are developing, if people lost their jobs, they either find a new job in the same industry, or they obtain the necessary training, partially funded by the government, in order to hop to another industry. Well, this happens in a healthy economy where jobs and learning opportunities exist. Government and institutions have the funding and will to help its own citizens. Not in an economy where the national political class had a bending civic duty to line its own pockets instead. In 1955, the Royal Dutch Shell discovered the biggest gas field in Europe. A gas bonanza followed. It was not before long, however, when the Dutch began to wonder whether the discovery of the gas field had truly been a blessing. People outside the energy industry began to lose their jobs. Other sectors of the economy slumped. In 1977, economists gave it a name, the Dutch disease. 
The Dutch disease is when one economic sector, such as energy, develops, that causes other sectors, such as manufacturing and agricultural, decline. This is exactly what happened in the resource states in Africa, and why so many people working in the non-energy sector lost their jobs. Here's how it works: When the dollars pay for the exported oil and gas, minerals, ogres, and gems push up the value of the local currency, imports become cheaper relative to locally made products, squeeze out the homegrown enterprises, making people who work in the industry lose their jobs. For countries that are about to industrialize, the process goes into reverse. Lacking industrial capacity, the opportunity of processing commodities to multiply their value 400-folds slip away. The resource states in Africa blankly watch their oil and minerals sail away in raw form. The values are added elsewhere. The beginning of the Dutch disease in Nigeria can be traced back to the discovery of the oil in the Niger Delta. It works like a pandemic. Its symptoms, in many cases, include poverty. And oppression, as local production is impossible to keep up due to expensive currency and electricity, the textile industry decayed. It creates a feedback loop to add new demand for imported clothes and fabrics, strengthening Mangal's operation, making local industries' resuscitation even unlikely. In Nigeria, the sale of crude oil generates 70% of government revenue. Sudan is 98%. For an industrialized economy, you would think custom receipts, taxes, and sale of state assets are the main source of income that funds the population's healthcare, education, and public infrastructure. But in the political economy that is based on embezzlement and manipulating public officers for private gain, the funding laid out in the government contract was not spent for the upkeep of functioning electricity system. Instead. It is diverted to the cronies of the rulers of the day. The pattern is the same in Angola or Congo. The more Nigeria's non-oil economy withered, the greater the impulse to embezzle. When hope is disappearing, guess you'd better take as much as possible for your own benefit, or to save for your children. In this shadow economy, where people's freedom is sacrificed to exchange for the generous gain of those who have common interests with the authorities. No wonder foreign aid never worked, because government money was never transferred to the development of the country, but to the smuggler, corrupted politicians, and foreign real estates. This is depressing, you might feel. So, is there a solution, by the way? While、well, nowhere near a expert to plot a solution, I do think the recent years of immigration and investment from China has a chance to lift the continent out of poverty. People might have told you that China is enslaving these countries using debt trap diplomacy. As a matter of fact, many economists have vastly different views on the matter, and this is still left to debate. After centuries of Western colonization and decades of foreign aid had done nothing for the development of the continent, instead of guessing the incentive, I'd rather see some real changes happen. Now roads are built, ports are established, cities are flourishing, people's living standards improve. Of course, it may still take years for the majority of the Africa population to climb out of poverty. In my humble position as a YouTuber that posts economic videos, I sincere hope for the best for Africa, and I do think changes are coming that will make Africa a great place to live.